I just want to wish you all again a, a happy octave day of Resurrection Sunday on our second Sunday of Easter, also called Divine Mercy Sunday, which evidently you see here. There's a very famous image, the, the, the image of Jesus, the one who brings divine mercy. I believe last year I probably commented more upon this, upon the story of Divine Mercy Sunday and the life of the saint who very much brought about this as a celebration to the Universal Church, Sister Maria Faustina. Uh, you should Google that story. If you forget that story, if you've never heard that story, that's an awesome one. Uh, one of the most significant events in all of 20th century was the story that was being, well, it was unfolding in silence and secret with Sister Maria and Jesus that brought about this celebration, Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday, which is now always the second Sunday of Easter. So, um, as we continue right on this octave day of, of Easter, we, we watch, we just continue to watch Jesus go to the most needful places in the hearts of his disciples and his apostles. And so it's good to remind ourselves again, the, it's always good to, to, to bring to mind the context, right, of the gospel that we're hearing. So let's put ourselves into the story again that we've just heard. When the scene opens up here in the 20th chapter of John's gospel, it says on the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. Okay, this story is unfolding on Resurrection Sunday. The gospel story you're hearing is still the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And the gospel says it's the evening of the day that Jesus first rose from the dead. So there's a lot of things that have happened, even on this Easter Sunday, that have led up to this evening moment of the apostles and Jesus. Okay, so what's already happened on this very day? On this very day, right, the, the, the women, disciples, have already gone to the tomb early in the morning. We get this sort of aggregate account from the various gospel writers as to how, like, how we're piecing this story together, right? So Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Judas, also Joanna, and Salome, um, Salome are there amongst the other women disciples. They go to the tomb early in the morning. And I think it's in Matthew's account, they tell us that they, they reach the tomb and the stone is rolled away and they see two angels on the inside who really freak them out. And the angels say, why do you look for Jesus? He's not here, the one that you seek, but he's been risen from the dead. Go and tell his disciples that he's risen. And they don't believe the, they just run in fright from these angels and they meet Jesus on their way back. And Jesus says, peace be with you. Go and tell my brothers, which you have seen, that I'm risen, that I will meet them in Galilee. And so they go back to the apostles early that morning, and, they, and the women disciples say, we've seen Jesus. And the apostles say, that's a tall tale. That's ridiculous. We don't believe you. So the apostles haven't seen Jesus yet, but the, disciple, but the women disciples are the first ones to see the resurrected Jesus in the gospel accounts. But then there's Peter and John, who listen to this story from the women apostles, the women uh, disciples, and they say, we have to go and check this out. And so they run to the tomb. And we have that account in John earlier, before what we heard today. And so Peter and John, in the early morning, after hearing this news from the women disciples, they run to the tomb and, and they don't see Jesus, but they see the burial cloths that are buried, that are there, that are left there. And in that account, we notice that they're both astonished. And it also says that John saw the burial cloths and believed. So Peter and John now have seen evidence of an empty tomb, but they haven't yet seen Jesus. Then later on that morning, two of the other disciples, not the apostles, but two other disciples, one of whom we know is Clopas, are walking away from Jerusalem to this town called Emmaus. Jesus meets them on the way, but they don't recognize him, right? It's about this time in between these two events that Mary Magdalene herself is staying behind because she evidently followed Peter and John, and she stayed at the tomb weeping, and she sees Jesus, who she thinks is a gardener at first, and she doesn't know it's Jesus until he says her name, Mary. So while this is happening, these two disciples are going to amaze, right? Jesus meets them. They don't recognize him. They just think he's a traveler. Later on, as they get towards the afternoon, they beg this traveler to stay with them. Jesus breaks bread with them and reveals himself, and they're like, we knew it was Jesus, and even before the evening hour, they rush back to Jerusalem and they tell the apostles, we've seen the Lord. And the apostles don't believe them. 
So the women disciples have seen Jesus. Mary Magdalene has had this special encounter with the Lord. Two of Jesus' disciples, one of whom is Clopas, have already seen Jesus. The apostles have not yet seen Jesus. They're still locked up in their room from morning until evening, evidently afraid of the Jews and what's about to happen. And then we get this portion of the story. So Jesus is now coming into a locked room, having already invited his apostles to believe on the testimony of someone else. And they haven't yet been able to believe because they're like, we need to see it. So 10 of them are there, right? We know Judas Iscariot is now gone. Thomas is evidently wherever Thomas is. Would love to have been a fly in the wall and known that story. What's he doing? He's the only one that wasn't afraid. He evidently was out and about somewhere. Thomas isn't around, but 10 of them are left. Jesus meets the 10. And when Jesus meets the 10, it doesn't say it in this account, but it says in the other gospel writer's account that they're, they're, they're so joyful. It says that they're, they were incredulous with joy, meaning they were, they were in disbelief with joy. And so Jesus says, here, I'm not a ghost. See my hands, see my feet. Do you have something to eat? Give me some fish. In some of these accounts, right, he's approving, he's showing them signs that it really is him. And their hearts, right, are so slow, right? What, what we've been witnessing over the last week, right, in time, we were listening to this last week during the Triduum, but in the gospel story, this was just happening a few days before, the unbelief, the, uh, the failures, right, of the disciples are on full display. On Holy Thursday, right, we hear the story of Jesus saying, okay, here's what's going to happen. You don't believe it. And then the next day, sure enough, it happens. And they run because they can't believe what they're seeing. And now they're in hiding because they're, they don't know about what it means to be risen from the dead, except perhaps maybe John, who it, the gospel specifically says he saw the burial cloths and he believed so John was blessed because he believed without seeing. So Jesus then goes into their place, into that locked place of disbelief, and he gives them what he knows they need most, which is the gift of his mercy. If we listen carefully to the story of the apostles and the transformation that their hearts need to go through, I would imagine that each of us is able to follow our own story through their story. You know, I've been reflecting upon this for the last week or so, maybe the last couple weeks. Joseph, you might have reminded me of it a couple weeks ago. Of You quoted uh, a, um, I think it was you, you quoted um, a contemporary spiritual author and priest, Father Jacques Philippe. Yes. If you had to guess what nationality it is, what, what would you think? Yes, French. Okay. Father Jacques Philippe, uh, very wise, very holy man, uh, spiritual director, writer, has written a lot of great stuff. You should get your hands on some of his books. But he has this really beautiful insight that has kind of stuck with me and I think speaks into the interior of the situation of the apostles in our gospel story and the resurrection account. Father Jacques Philippe says this about our world, about the world that we live in, like our modern day, and mankind in his sort of modern contemporary moment. He says this, he says, modern man, modern man is condemned to success. Modern man is condemned to success because without God, he has no place to take his failures. Modern man is condemned, has condemned himself to success because without God, he has no place to take his failures. And isn't that the truth, right? Isn't that the world that we live in? We walk out the doors of this church and what do we walk back into? We walk back into the world that is obsessed, infatuated, dependent upon nothing other than success and winning and accomplishing whatever it is it thinks it needs to win and accomplish and succeed at. And if that doesn't happen, if anyone goes out into that world and experiences failure, there's no mercy for you. There's no mercy for you if you fail at the world's expectations or if you fail at the endeavors that you try to accomplish. 
You just get shut up, canceled out, and ostracized. That's what happens in the world. If you're not successful in the way that the world demands you to be successful, you literally have no place to go. But here's the great irony of it. The great irony of human life is that we can't escape our failures, and we can't escape failure at all. I mean, no one lives a life of 100% success. If you have, raise your hand, because I want to know how you've done it. <laughs> but none of us have done it. In a world without God, there is no place for failure. Why does God come into the world? Because he needs to address failure. And failure happens in all shapes and forms. And what kind of way is failure happening in this story? Well, in the life of the apostles and in the life of the disciples, they're experiencing in these days a real failure to understand what's happening. They don't understand that Jesus has to die. They're in disbelief about that. They don't understand that Jesus has to rise from the dead. They're in disbelief about that. They experience a real failure to be able to control. They would like to have controlled the situation. They would like to have saved Jesus from his fate. They would like to have understood or had the kind of power or had the kind of weights that Jesus walked around with. They didn't have any of those things. They had no power. They, 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 they failed in, in their attempts to address their circumstances. They failed in their ability to transform their reality around them. They were unable to do that. They had all kinds of failures that they were walking around with. And in fact, what do those failures do? But those failures enclosed them in upon themselves into a locked room where nobody from the outside was allowed in. And on this Resurrection Sunday, Jesus, the first place he goes to his apostles after allowing them to kind of realize their failures, their minds became open to it because they were invited to look at it. Are you ready to believe yet? Are you ready to believe yet? No, we still want to control. No, we still want to understand in our own. No, we still want to depend on our own devices. And then Jesus comes into that locked door. And what Jesus does with that failure is he speaks his peace to it. And isn't this what mercy does? Mercy comes into the failures of mankind, not with a heavy hand, but with peace, which Jesus has already said in the Last Supper, the world can't give you that. Only I can give you that. Without God, man is condemned to his own realities. He's condemned to his own devices. He's condemned to his own power. And ultimately, he's condemned to his own failures because in the end, we all have a failure to understand. We all have a failure of our ability to control the situation or the circumstances. We all have a failure in our attempts to transform the world around us in the way that we see fit. All of us are condemned to that without God. But with God comes this gift, right? The gift of divine mercy. And when divine mercy is poured upon all of our failures, those failures are transformed. And they're transformed in such a gentle way because the Lord knows we need <laughs> gentle transformation most of the time. If he has to go in and do major surgery, he'll do that. But I think in my own life and probably in most of our lives, we come to know that God works very slowly and gently because we need it. Eight days later, they're still in a locked room and he comes again to them and he says again, in his mercy, peace. Peace be with you. Thomas, it's your return. I know that you have to see me. I know that you're not ready to surrender yet. So here, let me show you it's safe to surrender. Put your hands here. Put your fingers here. I want you to know that it's okay. And it's such a message then of consolation because Jesus, Jesus walks into our failures and reveals, I think, this sort of twofold gift. Number one, that he can walk into our locked places. We all have locked doors right in our own lives and our own hearts that nobody gets into. But God just is able to walk right through that wall at will. He can come into it. And so those locked places that we have aren't hidden from God. So God gives us a twofold truth. Number one, that he can walk into those locked places. And number two, he offers his peace to us in the midst of those locked places. While we're still in a place of safety, Jesus says, this is a transformation. The world doesn't even have to see it. It can just happen right here. How often 
Have we ever wondered and prayed for someone else's transformation and we don't see it, we don't see it, we don't see it, we don't see it, but then one day, somehow, it comes out of its locked door. But there's a whole journey that happened in that room in the secret of that time that God sits right in that journey of saying, I understand, you don't have to be transformed in public. I can come to you here in private, even in a way that nobody is going to see, because this is the kind of freedom that I want to give to you. The kind of freedom that allows you to know that I'm gentle and that I'm not going to hurt you. And I'm not going to put a heavy hand upon you in your failures, but I'm going to come into those failures and reveal them to you in such a way that my peace can come upon them. And as that transformation happens, then the story will continue, right? Not the next day, not the next week, not even the next month, but 50 days later, when some of that interior healing has occurred and has been allowed to be made whole again, Jesus then presses the Holy Spirit upon all of that, right, on the Pentecost. And on the Pentecost event, Jesus says, oh, you want to control your circumstances. You want to transform reality. You want to see healing come to the world? Me too. That's my desire too. And you're not going to do it with your own devices. You're going to do it with my devices. And that's what we heard in the first reading which comes from the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. P.S., if you want to read, if you just want to, like, listen, you read something awesome, read chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 3 and chapter 4. After Jesus begins to take his power, his divine mercy, into their lives and says, all right, now it's your turn to truly be sent and to do the things that I can do. It's incredible what occurs. The circumstances of the world do change. The realities of the world do change. Forgiveness is given to the world. Faith is given to the world. Belief is given to those who had no belief. That does happen. And it does happen at the, at the hands of, at the hearts of, at the actions of those whom Jesus sends, not with their own devices, but with the power of God most high. This is how divine mercy transforms us. It allows us not to be in a place of control, but in a place of surrender. And in that moment of entrustment to God, all the hidden broken things are made whole. And when that inner broken thing is made whole, it will eventually overflow in an outward manner in such a way that the world can see it as clearly being done by God. And because it's clearly seen as being done by God, Belief comes to the world. Transformation comes to the world. It's beautiful. It's awesome. And it has everything to do with what God has planned. So what a special gift of thanks then that we have on this Divine Mercy Sunday that Jesus simply shows us again and again and again, as many times as we need to hear it. He says, it's all right. I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to blame you. I'm here to, to heal you and to give you peace.